and delighted that we get to share this uh, conversation once again in times of such crazy, bizarre, and outrageous turmoil as is going on in the world today, as is going on in America today. Definitely presents us all with many opportunities to learn from process is that of removing every energetic pattern based in hostility or fear so that what never belonged within the human structure has its voice quelled. So that's what we're here to do, and we're delighted that you're here to share the space with us. Ms. Jenny, do we have anybody in the phone queue with a hand up? Anything happening in the chat room? It is all quiet on this end. All is quiet on the home front. Okay. Yeah. Well, then, let's go to page 61 of the Enlightenment book. We've been doing this now for 100-plus days, and we're drawing to a close of covering the book, although I, uh, I jumped around a little bit, and there may have been some pieces that I missed. If I did, because I actually wasn't properly uh, marking the book as we went through it, but if there are any pieces that you noticed that I missed and you'd like me to uh, go back to cover them, because we're on page 61 and, you know, just got a couple of pages left and we've gone through the whole text. But if I missed any and you notice it, it's something that's of an interest to you, please drop me a note or drop Jeannie a note. J E A N I E at W H Y again dot org. And uh, we'll make sure to, to cover it. And if there's anywhere, if you've got the manuscript and you're reviewing it or you're listening to any of the other shows, something's not clear, the whole objective of this part of the conversation, actually the whole objective of the last 14 years of, of doing this show has been to assist people to build the brain cells, to build the content into the mind so that the mind can bring forward constructs based in actuality rather than constructs based in just realities of whatever the mind has been through. If that makes sense, and I hope it does. And we had a hand just is, go up. Oh, great. Well, let's go for it. Okay. It's Miss Susan. I'd rather talk to you than myself. Zero. <laughs> Six Hi. Zero. You're on the air. Hi. I, I just wanted to report. How are you doing, Jeannie? Um, I'm able to use my arm more. I'm still being very uh, cautious with it, but uh, it's it's getting there. <laughs> Um, thank the other she tried arm. to arm wrestle me this morning. Oh, yeah. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's about How the same. You, I go back tomorrow morning. But you said the other arm was sympathetically doing the same thing. Is that okay? You're right on. Yeah, he's been one? he he's been doing acupuncture on both of them at the same time. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you for the report. I really appreciate it. Okay, carry on, guys. We'll do it. Thank you. Blessings. Mm-hmm. So on the top page, 61. And uh, it's interesting, you know, especially with the uh, the whole movement that's happening in America to uh, by a certain group of people to set up a Taliban-like so-called Christian nationalism um, where the actual teachings of Yeshua are ignored, which he predicted. You know, if you remember, there's a passage where he says, why are you coming to me telling me how you've cast out demons in my name and you've done this and you've done that, but you don't do what I told you to do? And in fact, there's a whole... I'm trying to think of the right word, group of so-called Christian churches that say, well, there's nothing you can do. Like 180 degrees, 
clear as a bell. Yeshua says, why aren't you doing what I tell you to do? And they'll tell you, there's nothing you can do. Pretty bizarre. Had an interesting post come across with all this uh, conversation about uh, immigrants. And someone posted a reverend, let me see if I can read his name. It's actually pretty small. Reverend Benjamin Kremer, Kremer. Put a post on Facebook. When I was hungry, you put up posters of the Ten Commandments in my classroom while making sure I didn't get a lunch at school. Whatever you do for the least of these, you do unto me, Jesus. And the half-truths that drive people who have unresolved hostility and fear are just pretty outrageous. And of course, if you know the fact of well, we should be able to post religious things in the church. Then, of course, if 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 that's true, if one wants to go in that direction, well, the founding fathers said, no. Historically, we've looked. I'm paraphrasing. Historically, we've looked, and that creates a lot of trouble. So we're going to separate out what the state does and what the church does. But if you're going to do this, well, you've got to be able to post this and. Of course, you should be able to post the five pillars of Islam, the precepts of Buddhism, the 613 Jewish laws, the Rastafarian commandments, Dharma of Hinduism, the principles of Shinto, you know, on and on and on goes the list. There are some, quote unquote, about 6,000 religions practiced in the world today, and one group of people says, oh no, it should be ours and we should be able to run the show. And if you look historically, wherever Taliban style we need to run the show has happened, it always, always ends up in absolute tragedy. And the reason I offer is because if you look at each of the religions, each of them prescribed a work to be done, and few people who follow them, or pardon me, purport to follow them, ever do what the what the directives were that created the foundation of the so-called religion. So it's pretty bizarre, but, but here's one. You don't see too many who've uh, who played this one out. So on Matthew 18, 8, 10, 9, and then 21 to 35. Now, if your hand or leg causes you to offend, cut it off and cast it away from you. Whoa. How many one-handed, one-legged Christians do you see around? For it's better to you for you to enter the perfect life, that is, community of love, while limping, than to have two hands and two legs and be cast into eternal fire. And and that idea of cast into eternal fire would be to be cut off from the active presence of love. And we people are cut off by the of the active presence of love by hostility and fear. And what hostility and fear do, and when you think about this as fire, what hostility and fear do is they create acid conditions in the human body. Acids burn. And that's exactly what happens. Literally, the cellular structure breaks down because where people live in hostility or fear, they you know, realizing that the core of the cell is acidic. The fluid that the cell is supposed to be bathing in is alkaline. Now, if you think about a battery, you've heard of an alkaline battery. There are an excess of electrons and in a core that is acidic. It has a positive charge and those electrons move. That's what a battery is. And, and basically the way the human structure is designed to work is interstitial fluids designed to be alkaline. The core of the cell is acid, and that creates what they call an EMF, an electromotive force, a literal electrical flow. Each cell is designed to be a battery, but if you play the game of hostility or fear, that's, that um, interstitial fluid turns acidic. Now you've got an acid envi- uh, environment in the cell, an acid in the cell, and the electrical potential, the electrical charge is gone. So it's built into the system that it will self-destruct very rapidly if we are not in alignment with what 
the whole system is about. And many people, if you if you check them out, and you can get you know, you can check your saliva and see where it's at uh, with simple uh, litmus paper. And so, definitely cut off from the presence of love, left to one's own resources of hostility and fear, the whole structure becomes acidic and acids burn. And then he goes on to say, if your eye causes you to offend, pluck it out, cast it away, or it's better that you enter your perfect life than your perfect life. Now, let's, let's go to the dictionary. Let's take a look at that word. If you've got the book, uh, the word K-H-A-Y-I-I. So let's go to the back of the book and uh, look at the dictionary. And we're going to page uh, 79, K-H-A-Y-A. So it says life, often used in the sense of your perfect life or reborn life. So being es escaping from, being removed from the world of hostility or fear, and being awakened to the fact that your created essence is active present love. And when active present love becomes the fuel for your physiology, then everything is transformed. So he's talking about entering into this state of perfect being, where being where the active presence of love fully incarnates in your form. So again, better that you enter your perfect life with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into, again, the fire. Get stuck in this acidic state. And here's an, an interesting one. Peter comes to me and says, My Lord, how many times if one wrongs me do I forgive my brother? Until seven times? And he says, is seven times enough? And Yeshua says to him, I did not say to you until seven, but until 70 times 77. So, in essence, what Yeshua was saying, if you look at that, I, I, I doubt that the disciples were standing there going, let's see now, 77 times 70. What, that's seven, seven is 49, carry the four. I, I, I doubt they were going for some sort of literal number, but if you look at, you know, Three times the seven is in this answer. And it, zero is infinity, so you take that seven zero, an infinite number of times until completion. So you're finished with whatever hostility or fear your mind and body generate. And he speaks of this community of love, Malkuta Dishmea, which the Greeks translate as the kingdom of heaven, is like a man a king who wished to receive an accounting from his servants. And as he began to receive it, it was brought to him one owing a hundred million, you know, the equivalent of a hundred million dollars. And he didn't have it to pay it. His master said, sell him, his wife, his sons, and all he has and make the payment. The servant went prostrate and worshipped him and said, let your spirit, Ruka, come upon me and everything I will pay you. The master tapped into or enacted love, the, the Aramaic, we're on uh, Matthew 18, 27, about two-thirds of the way down the page, on page 61, if you've got the Enlightenment book. He enacted love unto the servant, and set him free, and his debt was forgiven. Shebag, canceled, removed, let loose. The servant went forth and found one of his fellow servants, owed him a hundred dollars, and seized him and choked him and said, give me everything that you owe me. This fellow servant fell on his knees and begged. He said, let your spirit come upon me and I will pay you. In other words, have, have mercy, bring love toward me. But he didn't do so. Instead, he put him in prison until he should pay what he owed. And when the other servants learned what had happened, their sense of right was affronted and they came to the master. And the master called said, evil servant, all the debt I canceled for you as you wished of me. Are you not obliged likewise to have mercy on your fellow servant? Just as I had mercy on you and his master was angered and delivered him over to such times he paid every item of his debt. In like manner, manner will 
you know, when they talk about judgment day is at hand, they're not talking about some judge up on the throne saying this is what I'm going to do to you, but that the operative energy of the universe produces results according to what's sown into the field. So he says, in like manner, will that creative power, which in this case he refers to as my father, who's in the realm of the unmanifest, do unto you if you do not cancel from your mind the wrongs of your fellow man. In other words, whatever's in you that you've not dealt with, if you're in denial about it, if you're blaming someone else about it, that very energy will be what you use to build your brain's perceptual constructs of your other. He says, until you cancel that out of your mind, then all, all that will happen is you're going to replicate the same traumas over and over and over again. And his work was about forgiving, removing those traumas, not being forgiven. Forgiving is an act that one does to change the content of one's own structure. It's not about letting somebody else off the hook. And then he goes into a conversation, our next passage. If we go to the page, top of page 63. 19.3, the Pharisees approached him to test him. He said, is a man authorized by any reason to break the ties with his wife? And he answered and said to them, you have not read that he who created them from the very beginning, have you not read? He created the male and female. Because of this, a man will leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall be as one flesh. No longer they two, but instead are one. There's a pagra. You know, in, in Aramaic, when two people form a relationship, they form a third life. That in Aramaic was called a, a pagra. And the pagra itself has a personal code that goes beyond the personal code of the two individuals involved in the relationship. And therefore, he goes on to say, that which the Creator has created in combination with man will not be set aside. And then he said, well, why did Moses decree that there be given a letter of divorce and separation? And he said, Moses, in keeping with the rigidity of your minds, authorized you to divorce. But from the minute, the very beginning, it was not so. And and actually, in, this does not reflect in this passage, but... It speaks about, in, in the uh, original text, it speaks about putting away, as opposed to divorce, it's putting away a woman. And, you know, in that culture, basically women, and sadly, with some of the movements that are going on today, there's a strong move to take it back to that state where women were literal property. They were owned. They had no rights. They had no property rights. They were owned. And what would happen is that a man would, you know, get tired of his wife or, you know, he'd build up enough unconscious trauma that he tend to his brain's image of his wife that he couldn't stand to be around her again, so he'd put her away. Which meant basically he'd throw her out of the house and, you know, she couldn't work, she had no property and all she could do was try to exist. And what would happen is so this this turkey would would take another woman into his house until he got tired of her and throw her out and while you know his wife was still hanging around because she couldn't really do much of anything, then he'd bring her back and he'd throw her out and he'd bring her back so so what he was really talking about here was putting away a woman, putting someone away, and to move beyond that, you know when we live in a world where we think we are physical beings living in physical bodies, then we tend to think of ourselves as objects and others as objects. And when we relate to another as an object, of course, we live in a culture that, you know, when you're finished with an object, what do you do with it? You throw it away. You get rid of it. And so... It is with relationships oftentimes if one thinks of themselves as an object, as a body, and the person in relationship, they're relating to bodies, not beings. And bodies become throwaway because they're just objects after all. Until one truly opens to true relationship, 
being aware of themselves as human beings, as created love, and relating to another human being as created love, then a whole different personal code kicks into place. A whole different process happens. And all of a sudden, people don't become throwaway. Because beings, by our true nature, when we wake up to that true nature, we recognize ourselves as beings, as precious, and others just as precious because they are beings, not bodies. So Moses, in keeping with the rigidity of people's minds, basically people living in unconscious unaccessible parts of their own minds that were in need of healing. He says he authorized you to divorce, but from the beginning it was not so. So I say to you, he who leaves his wife without a husband and takes another commits adultery, and he who takes a woman so left commits adultery. In other words, if if this act of putting one out of one's life takes place, everybody's in trouble. His disciples then said to him, if it be thus between a man and his wife, is it not wives, wise? Pardon me. Is it not wise to accept the wife in marriage? He said, not every man is capable within himself of this commanded action, except to him who it is given. For there are those who are faithful from the womb of their mother and were born so. My interpretation from the years of working with the Aramaic is what he's in essence saying there is there are those who live in being and have compassion for all beings and so that would be faithful let's let's take a look at the dictionary definition of that one um and m h e m let's drop back into the dictionary And we're on page 83. Um, let me get that spelling proper. So this concept is one who exercises, and I'll have to go back and look at that, hemuta, faith, one who has faith, plus hemna. So let's look at this. Hemna. And that is At the bottom of page 76. So an individual who has fidelity, faith, trust. So that would be, my take would be, that would be someone who works from being. And underlying that state is hemne, a structure of mind underlying attitudes and judgments we describe as faith, Trust, usually faith in a true and loving creator. To live in that space of being, in essence, is what they're speaking of here. So to truly have the ability to do that becomes some, as he says, from day one, they they function from being and know who they are as beings rather than functioning out of the belief in themselves as bodies and others the same. So those who are faithful, who from men were given fidelity, and there are the faithful that made themselves faithful for the sake of the community of love, but who, who can endure it, endure it. In other words, it may take some work. If, if you weren't naturally born and weren't supported in childhood 
in experiencing yourself and those around you as beings created out of love, then, and, and to me that's the essence of this whole body of work, is to support people freeing themselves from every power person dynamic that has them believe something other believe in something other than themselves being creations of love and then to be able to see that in others. And so he says there are those who are born that way and those who then do the work to achieve that. And here's another one that uh, you don't see too many people doing. You know, we look at money, 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 and, and that, you know, for a lot of people, it's what it's all about. I know that years and years being on the road and, you know, we'd get an invitation and we'd, we'd go and speak in Greece. And say, well, wait a minute, you, you came here and you didn't charge us any money to come here and, and you're doing these workshops and you're not charging any money. Are you crazy? Well, we have a slightly different business model. Yes, we're open to be supported because, well, we offered while we were traveling, while we offered what we did free, we had not figured out how to do it for nothing. You know, being on the road, it was an expensive proposition. But there were many business people who who looked at me like, are you crazy? What do you mean you go wherever you're invited? What do you mean you pay your own expenses? What do you mean your workshops are free? Yeah, that's basically what it was about. So in this particular passage, which is chapter 19, 21 in Matthew, it says, if you wish to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give it to the poor. And there will your treasure be in the community of love. And come follow me. The young man heard this commanded action, Milta, and went away saddened, for he had many possessions. And Yeshua said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is difficult for a rich man to enter into the heavenly estate. Why? Because the mind is oriented toward the material world. And you look at how today children are raised in this. Everything is about what's going on in the outer world. Oh, look at this. I mean, right from birth. It's so much of it's about, oh, look out here, look out here. I've got some sort of shiny object for you. Oh, I've got a thing for you. Oh, I've got something for you. I have food, something that keeps the child out or directed all the time. When do we sit with the child and take time to go into the inner realm and to teach them that there is a whole life to be lived there? And to live that life is what Yeshua called a, your perfect life. So he's saying it's tough if somebody's totally focused in the outer world. And I say to you, it's difficult for a camel in the eye of the needle as a rich man entering the community of love. Now, that eye of the needle, when people think of a camel, and they're like, what, what, what does that mean? You know, How can a camel go through the eye of a needle? Well, if you don't know the history of the Aramaic and the Greeks didn't have a clue, Jerusalem was a walled city. They were an hospitable people. And so, yes, they would close the city down at night. They closed the city gates. But there always was one gate that was left open. And if someone came in the middle of the night, you didn't want to leave them out in the desert. And so that called the eye of the needle. Now, it wasn't a big open gate where if you came with an army and you wanted to invade the city, you could just rush right on in it and take over, attack the city. The eye of the needle was so such a small gate. You know, when they said, it's, more, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? What are they talking about? Well, if, if you arrived in the middle of the night and you wanted to go inside the city gates or the protection of the city, you had to go through the eye of the needle. That was a small gate. And... You couldn't take your fully loaded camel through that gate. You had to unload all of the things you were carrying. You couldn't have weapons and everything else on your camel and just go in through the gate. You had to unload it. And then the camel had to be forced down on its knees and and squeeze through the gate. So you couldn't bring an army in and, and attack. So that's what he was talking about. 
And his disciples, when they heard this, marveled and crying and said, who can live this perfect life? And he looked at him and he said, for men, for those basically who are living from carbon-based memory, those who live from perception, it's not possible. But should you awaken to the part of you that is a cell in what was in the ancient teachings called the mystical body of Christ, a cell in the body of the creator, then it's the only option. It's the only thing there is. And so this idea of a perfect life is to live as active present love. Now, does that mean anybody, at least nobody that I know of, has done it perfectly to date? But as one does the work, as one moves forward with the utilization of the tools, then it becomes more and more a natural state of being. And then in chapter 2143, there's just one, one statement there. And because of this, I say unto you, the kingdom of the community of love, when they talk about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in Aramaic, that was, would be properly translated today in English as the community of love. And what he says is, if you're, if you're lost in the material world in hostility or fear, then that presence of love is going to be taken from you and it'll be given to people that produce the fruit of a life based in act of present love. Let's see, we're just about through the halfway point, Miss Jeannie. Wondering if we have anything happening in the chat room or anybody in the phone queue. It's still if you're quiet out there the before. Scene. Okay, well, let's put out a request. If you're out there in listener land, if this is making sense, if it inspires any questions, any supports needed, we'll give an opportunity to push one. If you're on one of those stations where we can't see you, where we're syndicated, and we can't see you on our control panel, if you call into the show, and our call-in number is 563-999-3581, if you call that number, you'll be listening to the show directly, and then if you push one, that'll raise a hand, and Jenny will know you have a thought or a question for us. So is there anybody out there in this land want to make space to move into questions that uh, might open a different direction for our conversation? And hopefully serve the whole community on deeper and deeper levels. So anybody out there with a thought for us before we move forward? Okay, then let's go on to another topic that's rather, uh, um, what should I say, controversial in our culture. And that is Matthew chapter 22, 17, 21. And we're on the lower half of page 64. And it's just, they ask him, tell us how you understand it. Is there authority, authority in Caesar to levy a head tax, yes or no? And, you know, Yeshua understood that they were trying to test him. So he says, what, what are you testing in me, you hypocrites? Show me a coin for this head tax. And they presented a coin to him. He said, and whose image is inscription? He said, Caesar's. He says to them, therefore, give unto Caesar that which is Caesar, and render unto love, unto the creator, that which is of the creator. In other words, what he was saying is, hey, if you're in commerce, if you're in commercial business, you better pay the tax of the commercial law of the land. That's what Caesar's here for. And, in essence, he's saying, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm not playing in the realm of Caesar. And then in uh, Matthew 36, they ask him the question, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And... He says, thou shalt have all embracing love. So 
filter in the frontal lobes of the brain active when you think of the creator. And do that so that your entire mind and your whole state of being, your whole nausea, in all your actions and all your thoughts. So you have this all-embracing presence of love because this state of Rachma is active in you and Rachma being a filter in the frontal lobes of the brain that allows only data keyed to love to be active in the frontal lobes of the brain where intentions are formed and that of such import because the things that drive the perceptual mind, which is what results in all inclination toward behavior and speech, is the goals that we set. And so he says, you know, basically if you want to function the way I'm describing is possible for you to function, then you have this state of Rachma active so that you have, and it's interesting, we live in a culture that, you know, so much ends up being half-truths, and you hear people talking about unconditional love, unconditional love, unconditional love. And, of course, recognizing the perceptual mind works through resonance. Let's imagine, I say, don't think about the color of your car. What happens? Well, obviously, resonance takes over, and something about the color of your car moves. If I say unconditional love, what has to resonate in the mind? Love with conditions. So you want to shift language, always paying attention to speech. And so what do I want to move to? Rather than some sort of presence of being or love based on conditions, what I want to do is achieve a state where it doesn't matter what the conditions are. It doesn't matter what the circumstances in the world I'm able to breathe and I'm able to hold to my human life, the active presence of love. And when you do that, you embrace your entire mind, your whole state of being, and all of your actions and all of your thoughts are based in the active presence of love. He's saying that's, that's the first step in functioning as a human being. And he says, and that's the greatest commandment. That's the most important of all. And it takes precedence over everything else. And then the second one is, you shall have all embracing love for your neighbor. So living from this state of being love, you hold to the presence of love in the presence of any neighbor and in the presence of the creator. And what's the bottom line of that? Well, now you have a human life, no matter what. Hostility and fear does not rear its ugly head and leave you void of the presence of love and functioning out of some form of hostility or fear. And so the functioning as the presence of love is how you maintain a human life rather than Loving your neighbor, it's about being the presence of love in the presence of your neighbor. You know, there, there's no such thing as loving anyone. We have tender feelings towards someone, but when somebody says, I love you, it's usually very conditional, and it's conditional upon someone fulfilling the goals that one has for them. And if someone is not fulfilling those goals then any attachment of hostility or fear held in the mind of the person who's we're, we're referring to here, their hostility or fear is going to, to surface. And it is going to take a great deal of effort to keep bringing love forward when somebody basically at every turn just tears you apart. You know, I've acknowledged you, and I'm, I'm going to assume that you're still with us, Susan. I've acknowledged you many, many times, uh, and I really admire the work that you've been willing to do to keep coming back to the state of love when this young man that is your uh, grandson just has gone through every form of abuse that he could possibly do, reflecting his power person dynamic. And 
to me, you've been such a model for the willingness to keep confronting every part of your mind and keep coming back to your thoughts and your relationship with him and maintaining this presence of being in your own life. And, you know, many times you've everybody's heard me say that, you know, the having children is like having your unconscious mind hang out in true living color and don't be sound. Everything that someone hasn't dealt with, because their children come from the same energetic pattern as they do, and, well, the adult, we as adults have a stop button wired in, the child doesn't have a stop button. The inclination to punish is the inclination to force a stop button in the child so that they stop doing what it is that resonates what we haven't dealt with. The alternative to that is to recognize that, oh, I'm losing it if I'm in some form of hostility or fear, if I'm in some form of pain, if I'm in some form of trauma then I have work to do to return my own state of being to my mind and body. So he says, this is the second, is that you maintain that state of Rachma and therefore all-embracing love for not only your neighbor but for yourself. And then he says something really key here. He says, upon these two commandments, Hangs the Law and the Prophets. Now, if you go back, if you've got the book, you'll see, if you turn back a page, you'll see that they ask the question, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment, and the Aramaic word is pokdana, in the law, namosa? Now, when you go to this next passage where he finishes this up, and you'll see that he doesn't use either of those words. He uses a third Aramaic word. There's no distinction like this in the Greek or the English language. But he says, upon these two commandments hangs the orita. He doesn't say the pokdani or the nemosa. So pokdani would be, what is it that the leaders are telling people to do? What's the custom of this people? You know, we, we were sharing with Arya the other day that there are some places where when you eat a really good meal, it's a compliment to come up with a big, huge burp. Like, that says that's really awesome. So that would be like the Pogdana. That would be the, the customs of the people. And they use the word law and, and the word there is nemos, and, and you can't distinguish this from any kind of Greek translation. Uh, you have to go back to the Aramaic. And, and what he's talking about is, how, what are the customs in this culture that people follow? Nemosa. But then he switches the whole conversation by changing the word as he completes this whole idea. He says, the orita is what these two commandments, pardon me, upon these two commandments, the whole of the law hangs. And, and it's the difference between, so we're in the effect world, here are the customs, we have a custom of, no, you don't burp at the table, that's ignorant. They have a custom of, yeah, you burp to say thank you, that was a great meal. They're the customs, that would be the the customs that govern the people. And they were calling that law. And he says, no, 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 we're going to take this to a whole other level. And again, we're looking to have the Aramaic understanding. Is, so that would be, we could almost say, if we were going to try and create a passage to replace that, they were saying, what in the effect world is most important in terms of the rules that we're supposed to live by? Pogdani, Namosa. But then he finishes it off and he takes it back to, no, this requirement to maintain a human life, if you do this with the creator and with your neighbor, then you maintain your own life. And 
This is the cause law. So it'd be the difference between they're working in the effect realm, trying to come up with some rules for the effect, and many people, you know, they're looking for the rules. Go, give me a list of rules, and then when I follow the rules, then I'll have love, right? No. No, you've got to deal in the cause law in order to get back to where you truly are functioning as the active presence of love. So if we take someone who's in the effect world, and they're watching someone like Yeshua who's working in the cause world and doing monumental things they can't imagine, they say, well, how do we do that? They say, well, just give me a set of rules. Here, give me, this, give me the rule. Give me the rule. What do I do? What do I do? You can do all of the things that one who lives in the orita in God's law, you can do all those things and still not have orita. You're just following a script. You're following a set of rules. When you live in relationship to that orita, that cause law, then you do those things not because you're following rules, but because it is an expression of your being. And the whole objective was to bring out the expression of being. It's interesting. I can remember several years ago, Ginny and I were in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and somebody had invited us to a church. I won't name the church. You'd recognize it's a big mega I don't know whether it is today or not, but back then it was a big mega church. And um, someone had invited us, so we went with them. And it was just, to me, it was so tragic. There were about 5,000 people in the congregation, and we happened to go there on a Sunday where they were bringing children into the church, young people, teenagers, young teens, like, if I remember correctly, maybe 12, 13, 14 type thing. And so they bring these kids up on the stage, and the first thing that they're required to do to become members of this church, supposedly in the name of Yeshua, is they had to proclaim and admit that they were sinners. So in order to claim your human life, there was a rule. Oh, you have to admit that you're a sinner and give up the whole definition of expression of their human beingness. I mean, exactly backward. Because looking for this namosa, pogdani, looking in the effect world, trying to figure out how do we get to cause from effect, you can't do it. You've got to use the tools so that what dawns on you is cause, state of being as love. And from that, now that love is present, behaviors naturally flow. So they watch Yeshua doing that, but with their own minds in the dramas and traumas and power person dynamics of the generations, what did they do? They just played out the power person dynamics and said, well, okay, what's the rule? What do I have to do? Oh, I have to say nice words. So here I am muttering under my breath at this parent that just, you know, resonated generational rage in me. But I'm supposed to go, yes, Papa. Oh, yes, Father. Yes, I do love you. Yes, of course. Okay, yes, Papa. I'll be obedient. Trying to produce cause by following some sort of silly rule. As opposed to, if I recognize that I'm not in contact with cause, what are the tools that I can use that Yeshua gave? And he says, again, why are you not doing what I told you to do? You have to use the tools to produce the result. And when you produce the result, then the behaviors and the effect will naturally unfold from you. So that, in essence, is what he's saying here. Is the, the whole of the prophets, and here he, Arita is the word that he uses in Aramaic to represent the cause of the way things work. And then he also says that the prophets, here you go back, they're all a possession of the law. So upon these two commandments hangs the law and its prophets. The, those who taught the law were, were expressions of the law. It was like they were the property of the law. And so, you know, this is such a, to me, is such a big piece of the puzzle that, you do the work to arrive at the place where you are fully cognizant of yourself 
as the presence of love. You recognize that if anything less than love wants to come out of your mouth, no matter who you can blame, no matter how you can huff and puff and hold your breath and, and talk about how somebody did it to you, that you breathe, you open the space where perhaps generational traumas have been locked for eons of time. You breathe, you soften your jaw, you delete the trauma held there, and you bring love forward. No matter what is happening in your world, now you're at Orita, now you're dealing in cause law. There's not even anything that resembles the expression of that in the Greek or the English or the Latin language. It just, there's no, there's nowhere to go with it. And for me, this is another passage once you catch, capture the intricacies of it. Another passage that documents that the Aramaic was primary, that Aramaic first the Greeks translate, or I should say the Greeks misinterpreted from their understanding of it and tried to make up something that made sense. And, of course, as a result, here we are now in a culture that has some 32,000 sects of so-called Christianity, all proclaiming they have the answer. We're not proclaiming we have the answer here. We're proclaiming we have the tools. You are the answer. As you do your work, you and each person will have to arrive individually at the, the fruit they will bear will be the result of the work that they do. You know, often someone have called into the show and, gee, you know, they maybe spent months on the show processing something really traumatic for them. And then they call in at another time and it's like, gee, you know, I had that happen yesterday, and it was just like, oh, so what big deal? And it used to be, oh, my God, this is tragedy, terror, trauma. What's the difference? You, you're getting to experience the fruit of your work. That's the objective of doing the work, that you get to the point where your mind and body can't produce, your genes cannot produce hostility and fear anymore. And then Matthew chapter twenty three twelve. He who exalts his own nafsha, nafsha being the word that we would translate as soul, being, shall be humbled. In other words, who is it that's going to brag upon their own state of being? It's going to be the ego. The ego that's got some sort of deficiency that says, I have to be the tops and the best. And so... If you exalt your own state of being, then your own ego is going to take you down. And if you recognize that your being is just your being and it's the same as every other being, then you can look to, in an Aramaic, the word that's used here in, as it's translated in English is humility, but it isn't the Greek idea of this is another word that's been turned totally backward. Humility, grovel in the earth like a worm. That's what you deserve. You have to be humble. But in Aramaic, that word humility is a mental quality of being able to cooperate, to perceive and to cooperate with the highest and best intentions of another. So you're not locked into ego states of trying to exalt yourself. And... When you do that, then the presence of love will take care of that being exalted. The whole game changes. And we're at the point where we've got, let's see, about three minutes. So I'm going to just uh, put a hold on this instead of starting into a new chapter. And I'm just going to ask Miss Jeannie if we've got anything happening in the chat room or happening in the uh, phone queue you have a hand up and I believe you have a hand up and I believe it's oh, Dusty it. 904 we got about three minutes Dusty let's go for it what's on your mind sir yes mahalo and um, I just have to say how refreshing it is dear uh, 
dialogue that just keeps referring back to love. It just makes, it just, it helps me invigorate my, uh, just be full of that. And I, I, I just really appreciate that. Um, I mean, I keep hearing the word love. It doesn't come up once every 30 minutes. It comes up a lot, and that's good. Um, yeah, it's, you know, to me, it's the whole bottom line of it is the, the recognition of who we are. There's a great line in The Course of Miracles that says, enlightenment is but a recognition, not a change at all. Nothing changes when enlightenment comes, when, when being takes over the mind. It's just the recognition of who we are. It doesn't. It isn't that everything's turned around and changed. It's just the recognition. It's like, oh, oh, that was it. It's like, bingo. Yes, it, exactly. And more and more, I'm just feeling that uh, every every atom. I mean, I'm sort of just putting this into a frame of reference, but like just the space and the atoms. Everything's alive, and it's all love. Yeah, it's the bottom line of it all. It's the yeah. essence of that in which we live, move, and have our being, and we're designed to be reflections of that. And this garbage got in the way. And, you know, the, of, yeah. of all the teachings and teachers that have come, there's nobody that I know who put it together in a practical way if you get to the Aramaic of, and here's how you clean out the crap if you, if you choose to do so. You know, here's how you clean out the garbage and, and come back to the expression of who you are. Righto, so, righto. Pretty, pretty profound. It is profound. And, and just one real quickie, I love the little history lesson on the, on the camel and the eye of the needle. <laughs> it's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, when you hear that, it's like, oh, okay, now that makes sense. But what are you going to try to put a camel? Some people uh, tr translate the word camel as rope, put a rope through the eye of a needle. And even that one is, I mean, it, it doesn't even start to convey what was really going on in the cultural context. And so much just makes so much sense when we get to the oh, cultural yeah, that, context. That's beautiful. It, it's tactical, it's friendly, it's ever, it, and it explains all that, that, Never made sense. So, yeah, I loved it. And um, so anyways, uh, blessings for all. Aloha, my friend. Aloha. If when we finish, when we, we're, we're down to the last yep. few seconds, so we're going to close it out. If I turn around and dial your number, will you be available for a call for a minute? i got something I want to ask you. Yeah, yeah. give me about, uh, uh, about three or four Minutes, maybe up to five okay. minutes, because uh, I'm just well, finishing you, up. Why don't, and, you, yeah. why don't you give me a call in five then? Okay, I'll do that. Exactly. Thank you. All right, my friend. Blessings. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Create the best year yet of your eternal life. It's an awesome gift to give the world. Blessings. Bye-bye.